Amen. And good morning, everybody. Let's stand and join together in singing hymn 591, I am thine, O Lord. May be seated. It is good to see you this morning. We'd like to welcome you to our service of worship here at Grace Methodist Church. If you are worshiping with us in person, we want to know who you are, so we'd like to invite you to complete the tear off section of your bulletin and drop it in the offering plate a little bit later in the service. There's a place there where you can add to our prayer list or let us know if someone is better and ready for us to remove them. So we are grateful for your help with that. Also, if you're watching us online, we would also like to say welcome to you, that we are glad to have you with us this morning. We'd like to encourage you to leave us a comment, maybe share our worship service on your page so that others may worship with you. While you are doing those things, I want to remind you of the announcements that are on the back of your bulletin. I want to say um, we had a great trip last week. We missed you. Um, but we know that we left you in good hands and uh, with Gary and with the folks from Teen Challenge. And I know that they ministered to you in a very special way. So I'm grateful for, for their willingness to come and to share and to fill the pulpit for me while I am away. But I am really glad to be home and I'm glad to be back with you today. So, um, so we're glad to see you. There are a couple of things that I want to draw to your attention. First, we will screen the episode one of season four of The Chosen this evening at from 5 to 6.30. If you are not very familiar with The Chosen, it is a uh, dramatic reenactment of the scripture based on the scripture. And this is season four. It was at first made in, uh, for theaters and has been since made available to churches. 
and before it will be released to the general public. So I believe we have a short trailer. So if you aren't very familiar with The Chosen, you can see a little bit about what it looks like. Darkness is not the absence of light. It's more uncontrollable and sinister. You were there, waiting. Because the darkness is not dark to you. At least, not always. The coming darkness was too deep for us to grasp. It would appear that we now want the same thing as Spyro. Senior leaders in every district should question and expose Jesus. I just can't stop seeing how we could be doing things faster and more efficiently. You deserve a stipend for your specialized work. You can at least make sure that you have resources to keep the mission going. My ledgers are in the red. I told you to make life difficult for the followers of Jesus. It is on this rock that I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This infernal chaos. Why can no one control these people? What just happened to all of you? It's about to get worse. Now that I'm here, Physical death does not interrupt our eternal life. Lazarus! Come out! I remember you wishing there could be another way. And looking back, I do too. I still don't know why it has to be this way. The bitter often mingled with the sweet. You told us it would be like that with how you lived. The men of sorrows, acquainted with grief. So this evening, we'll not only be watching the first episode, we'll talk a little bit about the biblical basis for what we've seen, as well as have a chance to kind of discuss and think about what it might mean for us. It's a great opportunity if you know of someone that has wondered about the Christian faith, that maybe is curious about Jesus. It's a great way to see Jesus in a different light than just on the words of the Bible, uh, the pages of the Bible. So I'd encourage you to bring someone with you tonight. We'll have lemonade and popcorn, and for we should be finished about 6.30. So I'm looking forward to that tonight. Also, the Scott Watson Lynch Circle will meet on Tuesday, and so um, at 6 o'clock. And while I was away, we received our letter of official acceptance into the Global Methodist Church. So I am excited about that. Um, one of the things I do want you to know, and, and you'll see more about this next week, is that our annual conference um, of the Trinity Conference of the Global Methodist Church, which is the one in which we are a part now, will be June 20th through 22nd at First Methodist in Shreveport. So um, our conference in, encompasses churches in East Texas and Louisiana and Arkansas. So it may not always be in Shreveport an hour away. So I would like for you to consider going to annual conference and maybe hearing some of the preachers, uh, attending some of the worship services. I will be going, we'll be commuting back and forth every day. I think that's just as easy for me. So if you would like to ride with me, you're welcome to do so. I have printed out a couple of copies of the schedule and some of the preachers um, at annual conference. And they're on that back table next to the soundboard if you're interested in knowing more about that. So, um, and it, I will be busy most of the day if you'd like to ride with me, but it, you can go to the Seedbed Bookstore, you can visit with someone, you can there, look at some of the booths and exhibitions, so there'll be lots to do there on June 20th. So, um, so you'll hear more about that next week, but I did want you to be aware of it, and if you would like to go, let me know, and I would be glad to give you more information. All right, 
Anything else before we pray together? Yes, ma'am. I circle will not meet. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry about the confusion. So circle will not meet. Erase that, scratch that, go back, and um, the circle will not meet this summer. Okay? Then let's pray together. Oh, Lord, we are so grateful to be in your house. We are so grateful for your presence with us. And so, Lord, now as we gather, we pray that you would help us to set aside the, the worries of the last week, the concerns of the week that is to come. Lord, we pray that you would help us to turn our eyes upon Jesus. Lord, we do pray that you would help us to hear you speak into our hearts and lives, that you would give us the eyes to see you, the ears to hear you, and Lord, may we have the hearts to respond. Lord, we are so grateful for your presence with us this morning, and it's, we pray that you would lead us and guide us. And it's all these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand and join with me as we affirm our faith together using the ancient Nicene Creed. Would you stand as you and join with me? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. be seated as our ushers come forward to receive our offering and as they come let us pray together oh lord we are so grateful for the day that you've given us we're grateful for the many blessings in our lives the blessings of family and friends the blessings of home the blessings of time away the blessings of time spent with you so now lord as we give you back a portion of what you've given us Lord, we ask your blessing on these gifts that we give, that others might know the good news of Jesus Christ through them. And it's these things we ask in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
please remain standing as we join together in singing A Charge to Keep I Have. Please be seated. As we come to a time of prayer in our service, I do want to remind you of the prayer list that is on the back of your bulletin. I'd like to encourage you to take that home with you and continue to pray for those things during the week as well as the things that are on your heart and mind. So um, I do want to remind you to continue to pray for our ministry and mission partners. Uh, last week you heard from our friends at Adult and Teen Challenge. I believe that our uh, the Wesley Foundation is still on their mission trip in Africa, so we want to pray for them as they are doing God's work there. We want to continue to pray for our missionaries as they work um, to spread the good news of Jesus, not only here in our country, but around the world. Um, so we want to continue to pray for Dorothy Clark, for Amy Colvin, Adam Guillory as he's on his trip, um, Penny Gines. My mom is a little bit better, Leanne Smith, so I appreciate your prayers for her. And we are still kind of awaiting some answers there. So I know that um, several of those folks continue to be in need of our prayers. Are there others that you know of that you would like to mention this morning who are in need of our prayers? Yes, ma'am. For Linda Combs. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, for, fam for Pam Black. Yes, sir. Okay, for Brian Davis. Okay. All right, others this morning. Then let us join together in prayer. O oh Lord, we gather in your house this morning, knowing that you are still the, the God who is on the throne. You are still the one who is in charge. Even in a world that seems so backwards, Lord, we know that you are the one who still leads us and guides us. And so, Lord, we as we consider 1 Samuel and as we think about what it means to hear your voice and to follow it, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us. We pray that you would give us the ears to hear you. Lord, we pray that you would give us the courage to respond and to follow you where you lead us. But Lord, we know that this world can be a very difficult and sometimes intimidating place. But Lord, we know that you are with us, that you lead us and guide us even in the darkest of times. And so... We look to you for help and hope and guidance. Lord, we continue to pray for so many things that are going on in our world for peace. We continue to pray for your will to be done in a world that so often seems backwards and crazy. Lord, we continue to pray for our mission and ministry partners both here locally and around the world that you would bless them and use them to do your work. Lord, we continue to pray for friends and family who are sick, maybe facing a procedure, maybe recovering from one, maybe just under the weather. Lord, we have mentioned several this morning, and Lord, we 
pray that your healing touch would be upon them. And we pray that as your people, that we would do our part to show your love and care. Lord, we are also mindful of our friends and family who have lost a loved one to death. And we pray your comfort, your peace that passes understanding to be with them. And Lord, as we gather in your house, we may have other worries and concerns on our hearts and minds. Maybe it is someone who is sick. Maybe it's a friend or a family member. Maybe it's something at work. But Lord, whatever it is, what we know is that you love us, you care for us, and you hear us when we pray. And it's all these things we ask in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you, choir. Well, um, today I am beginning a message series out of the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. And over this summer, we're going to look at the characters, the two main characters of that book, uh, Samuel and then David. And so we're going to start with Samuel this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. So I invite you to hear the word of the Lord this morning. 
The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. Therefore I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord, but he was afraid to tell Eli the vision. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, Here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So if you have watched television in the past 20 years or so, the message title probably sounds familiar to you. It was first introduced by Verizon Wireless in 2002. And one of the key elements of the campaign, Can You Hear Me Now?, was the use of actor Par Paul Marcarelli as the test man to show the extent of the company's wireless networks. This is one of the first Verizon Can You Hear Me Now? commercials from 2002, at least I hope it is. Can you hear me now? Good. Can you hear me now? How do you build America's Good. largest wireless network? Can you hear me now? Good. By never being satisfied. Can you hear me now? Good. Until no matter where you go. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Your call goes through. Can you hear me now? Good. Verizon Wireless. We never stop working for you. Yes, flip phones were really a thing. <laughs> that Can You Hear Me Now campaign was a huge success for Verizon, helping the company establish itself as a leader in wireless network coverage. According to a study by the Nielsen Company, the campaign increased brand recognition, brand recognition for Verizon by 9% and helped the company improve customer loyalty. Additionally, Verizon saw a significant increase in new customers and overall sales after launching the campaign. The phrase, can you hear me now, became one of the most recognizable ad slogans of all time, 
and has even been added to the Oxford English Dictionary. The campaign was so effective that it was used by Verizon for several years and became synonymous with the company. It set a new standard for marketing in the telecommunications industry and showed the power of a well-executed marketing campaign to establish brand awareness and improve customer loyalties. It won several awards, including the Effie Award for Marketing Effectiveness and the Clio Award for Creativity. Overall, the Can You Hear Me Now commercial campaign is considered one of the most successful campaigns of all time. Its impact on Verizon's brand and lasting legacy are testament to its effectiveness and ability to connect with customers on an emotional level. I know you might be wondering, well, what does this have to do with 1 Samuel? And, but as I read and studied this scripture from 1 Samuel chapter 3, I couldn't help but think of that commercial. I couldn't help but think if sometimes God wonders, can you hear me now? It certainly seems that way in this morning's scripture. So here's a few ideas about how we might hear God speaking whether we are young like Samuel or old like Eli. The first thing I want you to see is that God does speak. God does speak. So if we look through the Bible from the very beginning to the very end, we find a God who loves us and who wants to have a relationship with us. From the very beginning, even after Adam and Eve sin and they go against what God told them to do, it is God who goes looking for them and calling for them. Throughout the scriptures, we see episodes where God speaks to humans directly. At other times, God speaks through signs or through other persons. We believe that today God still speaks through his word. There are a variety of ways in which God communicates with humans. But what we can say for certain is that God does speak to us. So imagine you're in Samuel's place, just a young boy, maybe as young as two, but more likely four or five, when he goes to live in the temple with the old priest Eli. Now, if you read back in 1 Samuel chapters 1 and 2, and we didn't read it this morning, that Samuel's mother, Hannah, had prayed for a son that she was barren. And God gave her one. And, and she said that, God, if you give me a son, I will dedicate him to God's service. By the way, that story of Hannah and, and her answered prayer her is a great story. It's worth reading this week if you have some time from 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2. If you haven't ever read it, read it it's, a, it's a great story about how God answers her prayer. So Samuel is at the temple and I imagine that he has all the energy and enthusiasm of a child. But Eli is old. In fact, the scripture tells us that his eyesight had grown dim. Eli's sons were next in line to become the priests of Israel, but they were not Eli. In fact, they were outright frauds. The NIV translates the Hebrew word belial, literally corrupt, as scoundrels. The New American Standard Bible translates it wicked. That's how Eli's sons are depicted in the Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 2 tells us that Eli's sons were so bad that they used sacrifices made for, to God that they used those sacrifices for personal gain. 1 Samuel 3 gives us the idea of the area and the, the region of the times. He says, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. So that's the kind of situation that, Sam, that Samuel finds himself in. The scripture tells us that his sleeping quarters were in the sanctuary right next to the Ark of the Covenant. His job is likely to make sure that the lights on the menorah stay lit throughout the night. 
that he would be the one who would stay up and to refill the oil when it burned down. So one night while Eli and his sons are sleeping, God calls to Samuel. Samuel is afraid that he hears this strange voice and all the first thing he can think of is, I, it must be Eli. Who else would be calling him? So he races to Eli's bed and he says, here I am. I heard your call. But Eli says, my son, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. As he falls asleep once more, he hears the voice again. Samuel, again, he goes to Eli's bed. And again, Eli says that he did not call. And this happens a third time. We are told in the scriptures that Samuel did not know the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So who was calling him? Samuel at first had no idea, but then he, with Eli's help, was willing to, to hear and to serve God. I read a story about a fellow named Bob Lesnow who was raised in a Christian home, but by the time he turned 16, Bob had given up trying to please God. He figured he was always offending God with one sin or another, so he decided to put religion behind him. One day, Bob was working in Wyandotte, Michigan, and he decided to eat lunch at a restaurant named The Big Boy there. And he sat at the counter, and no one knew he was at the restaurant, and he had strangers on either side of him. But as Bob was eating lunch at the counter, he felt a tap on his shoulder. And he turned around to see a scholarly looking man. He didn't know the man. The stranger looked at Bob and said, I want to see you in church. Bob was dumbfounded and even embarrassed. Why me? He thought to himself. He wasn't attending church at the time and he admitted that he was behaving in less than holy ways. At first, he thought the man was soliciting for his own church. So Bob informed the stranger, well, I don't live in town. Oh, I didn't say what church, the man replied. I said, I want to see you in church. Bob swiveled away for a few seconds to think about the strange comment, and when he turned back, the man was gone. He looked all over the restaurant, but he couldn't find the man. Upon returning home, Bob told his wife what had happened. They decided that if God wanted them in church so much that he would go to all this trouble, they ought to give it a try. Soon, Bob and his wife joined a church. So what we can say is that God does speak. Secondly, I want you to think about, are we listening? Are we listening? It's amazing to me that it took old Eli three times before he realized that it was God who was calling Samuel. You would think that a priest who has devoted his life to God's service would realize sooner who is calling Samuel. But to Eli's credit, he finally tells Samuel that if he hears the voice again, to reply, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I wonder if God is still calling we just talked about that God is still in the speaking business. What about us? Are we listening? Could it be that we don't listen very well? What prevents us from hearing? Maybe it's all the noise in our life. Maybe it's running from this and that to the other that we don't spend time listening. Maybe what we truly need is to discipline ourselves to hear and to listen for the voice of God. I read of a story of a young man in the Great Depression who saw a help wanted ad for a telegraph operator. He had studied Morse code at home while unemployed, but he had no experience. And when he got to the business, his heart sank when he saw that there was a room full of other men seeking the same job. But he found a chair and sank into it, already feeling dejected that he was not going to get this job either. 
After only a few minutes, however, his face brightened up. He jumped out of his chair and ran into the manager's office. Within a few moments, the manager appeared at the door to announce that the door, that the job had been filled. One of the other men who had been waiting asked with great astonishment, what did he say that landed him the job? After all, he was the last one here. The manager answered, oh, it was nothing that he said all morning long. I've been tapping out a message on my office window in Morse code. It was loud enough for all of you to hear. The message was this. If you understand this message, come on in. You're hired. All of you heard the noise. He was the only one who listened. I couldn't help but think that maybe that's how God is with us, that God may get frustrated with us, trying to speak to some of us who will simply not listen. Since you got up this morning and made your way to this house of worship, God has been trying to speak to you and I. Maybe it's through the beauty of creation. Maybe it's through the love of family and friends. Maybe it's through the hymns we sing and the scripture we read. In a hundred different ways, God is speaking. But only a few of us will really hear. God speaks. Are we listening? The last thing I want you to see is that here I am should be our response. Here I am should be our response. So after waking up Eli for the third time, I can only imagine that Eli is a little bit perturbed at this point. Samuel goes back to bed with the instruction to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So when God calls the fourth time, Samuel responds with Eli's instructions and God speaks this word to Samuel about how he is going to bless him and about what's going to happen to Eli's sons and that he is going to be with him no matter what happens. We must understand that when God calls, our response should be like Eli's. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. There's a story that comes out of the Civil War about General Stonewall Jackson, that he was at his camp with his troops miles from the headquarters of General Robert E. Lee, the commander-in-chief of the Confederate forces. A messenger informed Jackson that General Lee wished to see him. And in the message that Lee sent to Jackson, he told Jackson that he could come at his leisure since the matter was not of great importance. As soon as Stonewall Jackson received the message, he had his horse saddled and rushed to General Lee's headquarters. He rode through a terrible freezing rain. The road was icy and muddy, and he arrived at Lee's camp just as the general was finishing breakfast. Lee looked out of his tent and spotted Jackson riding through the snow and the rain and the ice, and he hurried out to meet him, and he said, I told you it was not a matter of great importance. Jackson replied, when my general wishes to see me, my general's wish is my command. May we respond the same, that when we hear God's voice speaking, may we follow and do what it says. I want you to notice that what we hear from God is not always good news. I wish that it was Always good news, don't you? But that night in the temple, God speaks to Samuel and he talks about how Samuel will become a prophet and in st that Eli's house will be punished because of his sons. Samuel would take Eli's place. Can you imagine trying to tell that to Eli the next morning? To say, well, God did come to me. God spoke to me and he says that your line is out that I am going to be the priest. But God assured him that he would not be alone. You see, when God speaks, decisions must be made. Samuel was so troubled by what he heard from God that he was unable to sleep that night. He had been, he had been awakened four times in one night, and then the last time he was given this message of both good news and 
bad news. By the way, everything happened just as God told Samuel that it would. If you read ahead in 1 Samuel chapter 4, Eli's worthless, corrupt sons remove the ark from its place in Shiloh, take it into battle with the Philistines. The battle was lost. The sons were killed. The ark of the covenant was captured. And when Eli was told the devastating news, he fell, broke his neck, and died. The closing verses of chapter 3 tells us that all Israel knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. Our response when God calls should be, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Tracy McKenzie tells the story of a woman whose husband had died eight years before. And they were speaking of the assurances of Scripture that God would be with them, particularly of the Holy Spirit. And the woman said, but there are still days when I wonder if God is truly with me. She said that she had prayed for a sign of assurance since the death of her husband and had never received it. Tracy said, well, maybe there had been signs, but maybe you missed them. The woman, the widow, or the widow still then mentioned that she and her husband loved to watch the birds in the backyard on their patio. Among the, her favorites were the red buds, red birds, the cardinals, but she had not seen a red bird since the death of her husband, is what she said. Tracy said that she would pray for her that a sign would be delivered, that she would see a red bird. That was on a Tuesday. This is what Tracy writes. Two days later, she called me. That morning, while drinking her coffee, there appeared on her back porch two red birds, a male and a female. And she said she felt a peace that she had not felt for some time. Tracy says, was it the power of my no doubt awesome prayer that brought the red birds to her porch? Not nearly. Those red birds may have come and gone a number of times, but her grief became a barrier to her seeing and noticing them. If we want God to be revealed in our lives, we had better begin by expecting it and watching for it. How many times do you prepare for your day by asking God to be revealed in the middle of it? How many times do you prepare for church by asking God to speak to you in the music, in the sermon, and the others in the congregation? How many of us honestly, truly expect a real life changing encounter with God in our daily comings and goings? I can tell you that those few who do expect such things, find them. Make space in your life to have a real encounter with God. It might be here, it might be anywhere, but expect that it will happen. Get up in the morning wondering where it will come and go to sleep listening for God's voice. Read your Bible expecting to hear God and come to the table open to receive. God will show up, I promise. And so God speaks to us in many ways. Maybe we need to spend more time listening. And when we hear God's voice, may we respond to God's call by saying, Speak, your servant is listening. May we respond as young Samuel did. May we follow, hear and follow the voice of God. And so I ask the congregation of Grace Methodist Church, on behalf of God, our Lord and Savior, can you hear me now? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to invite you to take your hymnal and turn with me to page 730 as we prepare to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion. While you're turning, I want to remind you that this is the Lord's table. It is not a Methodist table. It is not our church's table. It is open to all who want to come and to receive the grace and mercy of God to seek Jesus and to know him. 
I also want to remind you that if you'd like to receive the sacrament but are unable to come to the front, we would be glad to bring the sacrament to you. There are some prepackaged sets of um, the communion elements in the back, I believe also here at the choir. So you're welcome to use those as well. But if you'd like to receive and don't want to come to the front, we would be glad to bring it to you. So here now this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who truly love him who earnestly repent of their sin, who dwell in charity with their neighbors and intend to live a holy life. Draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort, making your humble confession to Almighty God. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, we confess and lament that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. Because the remembrance of our sin is more than we can bear, have mercy on us and forgive us. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, pardon us of all that is past and grant that we may ever serve you in newness of life. To the glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In his great mercy, our almighty God and heavenly Father has promised forgiveness of sins to all who repent and with true faith turn to him. May he have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear these comforting words that Jesus Christ our Savior says to all who turn to him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. And now if you would please join with me in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give our thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good to give him thanks and praise. It is right and our joy to give thanks to you in all places and at all times, Almighty Father. You are the source of all truth, life, and love. You made us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When in our sinfulness we turned away from you and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you with the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, forever singing this hymn to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All praise and glory is yours, O God, our Father, for in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to the world. Your Spirit anointed him to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to comfort those who mourn, to proclaim freedom for captives, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce the year of the Lord's favor. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate this memorial of our redemption, O Father, receiving these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine with thanksgiving for the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for us the body and blood of Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and partake of his most blessed body and blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, and one is your church, that Christ may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and gather us together with all your saints in the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. 
We ask this through your Son, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit and your holy church be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. May it preserve your body and soul to everlasting life. This is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you. Let us pray. We do not presume to come to this, your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs from under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. These are the gifts of, the God, of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith. With thanksgiving. The choir will be served first, and after the choir has been served, we'd like to invite you to come by the center aisle and either stand or kneel at the communion rail, whichever is easier for you. You'll be given a piece of bread, please take and eat it. You'll be given a cup of juice, please take and drink it. And after you have eaten the bread and drank the cup, we invite you to remain at the communion rail for a moment of prayer. And when you're finished, dismiss yourself to return to your seat by the side aisle. Remember, I would be glad to bring the sacrament to you. Just wave at me or get my attention and so that I don't forget you. The Lord's table is open. Would you come to receive the goodness and mercy of God?
as we come to a time of response in our service. The altar is open if you would like to come and pray. I'll be glad to pray with you if you'd like for me to do so. I'd also be glad to talk with you more if you'd like to know more about becoming a member at Grace or accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. Our closing hymn this morning is number 589. Here I am, Lord. I hope it will be more than just a hymn for us. I hope it will be our prayer, our response to God's call. We'll sing the first and the last. Would you stand as we sing together number 589, Here I Am, Lord. It has been good to see you in God's house today. We look forward to seeing you again tonight as we screen episode one, season four of The Chosen. Bring someone with you for that. Next Sunday, we will continue our series on the book of 1 Samuel. It's also so good to see Joanne Davis and Trevor and Talon. They are back for a quick visit from Utah. Um, so um, I know you'll want to speak to them and to say welcome back and it's good to see you and we're so glad that y'all have chosen to worship with us this morning so I know you'll want to speak with them and say hi to them on your way out. So with all of that let us close in prayer. Oh Lord we are so grateful for your presence with us. Lord we are so grateful that you are still in the calling and speaking business. Lord we are so grateful that you love us enough to call us and to speak to us and to to share yourself with us. Lord, we pray that you would help us to listen. And Lord, that when we do hear you, that we would respond in faith. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Give us the courage and the faith to hear you and to follow you. It's all these things we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.